a little bit about Brian. He is, um, he's our board member. Uh, he is also our marketing chair, and he has been on the QA of things uh, since 1995. Brian, it's your turn. Go for Quality 2020. That works. Thank you. I've been thinking about this moment for months, as you can imagine. I'm going to jump right into the topic, and then I'll share a little bit about where I'm going with it and uh, what I hope you get out of it, and uh, go from there. The next 90 minutes, I want to talk about quality and focus on that word, because I think so often we talk about quality this and quality that, and it's an additive to what we're trying to go after. But I think we should be subject matter experts on the word itself. Something I'm going to use over and over again is this equation. Quality plus context equals what we're going after. That equation will never deviate. A lot of people try and solve quality on what we're going after, and we need to understand that component of the equation and use it to drive our context to be effective at what we're going after. And we've got so many competing pressures coming up on the horizon now that I wanted to dedicate a session a topic so that we can wrap our heads around this. And I'm gonna get some input from you as well as we go towards this, because we have some brilliant minds. That's what I love about PNSQC, is this collaboration of our experiences and where we're going. So thank you for joining me in this journey. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about uh, uh, some detail here. Um, housekeeping. If this session isn't what you were expecting or at any time you're thinking, hey, you know, uh, let me check out another session, no harm, no foul. This is a great conference and there's lots of stuff. Restrooms accessible by the side doors if you feel you need to go. We are gonna take a break about 45 minutes into this, um, so that's planned. There is gonna be some dialogue uh, feedback, so we'll get into that. And uh, other than that, um, yeah, we're gonna have some fun with this. Are there any questions before I start? Things that people need to, all right. So a bit about myself, um, I've been, involved with software, and I jumped into the quality arena very quickly. I was hired uh, as a temp in Microsoft 1995 when Start Me Up was the theme song. Uh, you know, and the Rolling Stones were doing the launch of the Start Menu, and uh, they brought me in to support Microsoft Word, and then ended up training me for two weeks how to use a, cl a Mac Classic. I never expected that. I'm thinking Microsoft, the next big thing, and they went with the business need, so I was on a team of people supporting Mac Word. Great, you know, love the opportunity, got hired full-time by Microsoft, and then we got involved in beta testing. And I immediately got excited about the opportunity to influence a multi, you know, wide user-based project that uh, was gonna have, you know, huge ramifications. And so ever since then, that's been my focus, is I want to influence that customer experience, that collection of features that's a concert of uh, sustained customer enjoyment. So I've been in healthcare, I've been in uh, insurance, I've done government, telecom, uh, and different variations of that along the way. So I've had what I'd consider a lot of different venues to test, uh, if you will, where quality can be applied, some of the pitfalls and that we get ourselves trapped into going after one goal and missing others. And so I want to share some of that experience with you here today. and use it as part of the trajectory of, of where I want to go, uh, defining quality. I'm also a musician. Just on my iPad alone, I've got about 20 different synthesizers. Um, I love that aspect of creativity, and I think, uh, I think a lot of us have different aspects that we use creativity outside of our, our role and job, but we find, ironically, it helps us be more effective at our, our technical role. I'd find your niche if you're still looking for one, because I found it to be a great complement to what I go after. Love dogs. I just, you know, just advocate for that. Uh, I just recently, uh, my wife and I, we had a 14-year-old dog that was a, a Korean Jindu that was left in the backyard for roughly five years, no vet care, and abandoned, crooked teeth, everything, and we brought it in for about three months, knowing that we were going to give it the best three months it ever had, and it acclimated to our dogs, and just seeing that evolution of a life uh, helped by that, and then being an advocate for that kind of a thing is a big part of uh, my definition as well. So that's who's in front of you right now. So let me tell you something else about who's in front of you right now. I'm a board member. I've been at Toastmasters. I'm an extrovert. 
and I am not a circuit speaker. I've presented at PNSQC one other time, and that was on a backup for someone that didn't show, and this one. So I'm going along this journey with you by the seat of my pants, and I'm excited because, again, this is the venue that PNSQC's mission statement is all about, to enable the information wide open of sharing of software quality. And if I can be an example to you and say, you know what, I'm gutsy enough to go for this, I hope it's a catalyst for you guys as well to take your idea, your insights, your trajectory and, and where you want to go and say, I can write a paper on that. We've just started doing uh, presentation only acceptance. And if it meets the bar, which is high, of our, of our review, you guys can be on the track of being able to share your own expertise and contribute to the to uh, our intellectual capital here at uh, you know, the industry and PNSQC. So that's what I'm rolling into and I thank you for support going into this. I was talking about, whoops, wrong button. I was talking about this particular presentation with my dad about a week ago. And he worked for IBM for about 44 years. And at the time, and watching him growing up do that, it wasn't uncommon to have someone invested in a career, invested in a company, going after you know, pension, when that word still existed. Um, I'm sure there's still a few places that have that. And I was sharing with him a topic, and he says, you know what? He says one of the things in the more memorable situations he was in when he was working with IBM is he was assigned on a team to go. He was in Federal Systems Division. And they were being assigned to tackle a, a project. It was either the Trident or the shuttle uh, at Vandenberg Air Force Base, or one of those ones in between. And they were instructed to go to a class prior to the engagement where they were going to be told how to do things the right way. And it ended up being a week-long seminar about quality. This is in the mid to late 70s. And he still remembers that experience as being crucial into the success of that particular engagement they were about to go and learning how to undo a lot of the um, assumptions and statistical stuff that you know, IBM was good at at that point. And they rethought what it meant to put the context of quality and define their objectives in that regard. And they made amazing strides and carried that information forward. And he remembers that to this day as being a pivotal point in his journey. And I think we have the opportunity as quality professionals to have that same impact in our work environments and our careers. And I'm hoping uh, we take the opportunity to do that. So my goal here is to explore where we're going, start at the root of what is quality. And in this presentation, it's going to seem like I do a scattershot of a lot of different areas. And that's kind of by design because this is a pretty broad topic. So if you hang with me, we're going to touch on a lot of different pieces. And what I'm going to do towards the second half of this is synthesize it together to create a strategy where I think we're going to be able to evidence value and start putting that as a consistent theme to our quality roadmap and journey on our teams and our companies. So yeah, it's going to go broad, but we're going to get to the central part here. So bear with me on that. So. Quality, let's talk about that word. A lot of people think that quality started with Kaizen or you know, Japanese continuous improvement or Deming, um, total quality management in the 50s and that aspect, which were fantastic, innovative, uh, putting together principles and practices for consistent quality and being able to share the idea and vision where that's going. I think to understand quality, we need to go back a little further to the origin of the word. And it's philosophical in its roots. I don't know how many of you heard this, but basically, Cicero, 45 BC, was observing a conversation between Socrates and Plato. And they were having this discussion, basically saying, if I can afford a product or service, and I'm solicited for that product or service, and I end up buying it, that action does not necessarily imply that I thought what I got was a quality product or service. It's a true statement. And that discussion and that debate generated the word qualitas, 
of what kind of such qualis, I mean, qualitas and then eventually quality, character, disposition. A little bit more evolution of that definition is you have measured quality and unmeasured quality. Unmeasured quality is a degree of excellence. We probably have heard that term at some point. Um, a degree of excellence, you know, you, now you've got to put the legend on it. What do you mean? To what degree? And then there's measured quality, which is a specific distinction, characteristic, like to like. Now you're comparing qualities. This person has that kind of quality. This car has these qualities about it. Those can be measured. And so, so often that becomes the focal point of our context, what we're doing. So that's where this started from. So what I'd like to hear from you guys as well as we jump into this, what do you guys think are some of the challenges that we're about to run into? Before I launch into my view of it, I want to use the expertise of, of this community and have you guys discuss among your, yourselves for just a couple of moments here. What do you think are challenges? What do you think is going to make testing, reporting, quality coverage more difficult? So take a moment, talk among yourselves, share some thoughts. We'll write some up here and we'll go from there. Muzak 66? Muzak 66. Okay, just a few more seconds here, we'll wrap up. Okay. Great dialogue. So, I'm gonna pull the audience, toss some ideas. Toss some words, toss some phrases. What do you guys think uh, is going to be a challenge? Increase complexity. Increase complexity. Fast feedback. Fast feedback? Meet that Tools to meet that feedback. Security. Do more with less. Do more with less. Yeah. Automation. Automation? Time to market. Time to market. Yes. Customer diversity. <coughs> Even the definition of customer and what client and customer is going to evolve. That yeah, no, that's absolutely right.
they're doing acceptance, uh, acceptance criteria checking, but not really testing. Got it. Checking the boxes, but understanding the product. Great. Testing versus... What? Communication. Communication. Absolutely. We're going to talk about that, actually. We're going to talk about a lot of these. Okay, one more. Complexity, do more with less, fast feedback, automation, tools for feedback, time to market, security, customer diversity, testing versus actual product coverage, exploratory, if you will, heuristics, communication, delivery methods, using cloud and software as a service. What about connected devices as a service? All valid, every single one of those. And there's more. That's why we're here. That's why we're excited with the challenge and excitement, but yet sometimes overwhelmed with the complexity of what we're up against. And to do right by not only our career and our, and our uh, companies, but also the client expectations. We've always had quality as part of our trajectory. We've been doing this for hundreds and thousands of years, whether we're building a temple or a pyramid or a large ocean vessel, and then, here comes software. Software is relatively new in the industrial journey on this, and a lot of technologists would agree around 1972, the Trident submarine, million lines of code, iterative feedback on a large scale is about the tipping point where that became, this is where we're gonna go going forward. And so from that point forward, we've iterated, we've gotten better, new methodologies and improving. Our intent to deliver software quality and have that be embedded in. Our desire for that hasn't changed, but I think it's gonna be, and this is the premise of this conversation, more difficult to justify intentional direction towards that with the competing pressures like time to market, like what coverage means and the complexity of delivery mechanisms. And so we need to understand what those factors are going forward to do a service to ourselves, our career, our budget, our customers, all those factors. And so I want to start dissecting some of that and go forward on this. Here's some of the pressures that I came up with, knowing that you guys are going to throw a lot of these. And so I'm just going to run through these real quick. Um, this is my, my predictive analysis on where some of this was going to go. <coughs> Client customer expectations. We need to understand the new version. Remember, quality plus context equals what's right for that time, that situation. And customers and clients nowadays are going to start to have new vocabulary, thanks to innovation by product managers and owners, called capability and extensibility. Those words are now part of what is expected, not just a collection of features in a point in time for a release, but the ability to say, you've given me a sample data set for the capability that you're delivering that I can now aggregate my data, assign value, and create the experience that you told me I could build based on your platform. And you're gonna grow and scale with me as we do this. That's gonna become more and more the norm of what that means to meet client customer expectations and do that in concert, maybe as part of a larger ecosystem. Risks. There's gonna be new risks coming forward. We're gonna talk about security in a little bit here. What about just the ability to uh, data hosting options? Um, I worked at one of the largest consulting companies in the world and we still had issues in our test environment because the one VPN aspect for many of the hosted uh, testing sites was on a completely different authentication mechanism than the other one. And we had to bypass some key functional and end-to-end -end testing and lobby, some of that code was going to go immediately to the beta test environment, which we justified an exception for in order to hit key coverage in a timely manner. 
or take the risk that we weren't going to test it at all until we got to production, until they solve that issue. That's real scenario, and we've got to be ready to deal with that uh, in concert, you know, have those, have those dialogues. What about this? What about quality evangelism and advocacy within our companies? It's a question because less and less I see that term being used. Everyone believes in it. Everyone advocates for it. But where is that model within our companies? Where is that voice? Where is that evangelism saying, these guys have a quality strategy and mechanism and they're developing that in concert with our company? If we don't pay attention to that, that's going to fade away. That's not going to stay static. I think that's a challenge we need to be considering. Okay, what about value versus cost center? Time to market, remember? Do more with less. So how do we position our quality strategy and just wanting to test right and be as efficient as possible and put a dollar sign next to that saying we are adding value to the equation instead of being a cost center that has to justify budget as an insurance item. We don't want to think of ourselves that way. I mean, let's, let's be real. But in the reality, when CTOs and CIOs are making budget conscious decisions for the enterprise or in the middle of a merge, these kind of discussions come up and we owe it to ourselves because we're smart enough to put together a strategy that says, we're gonna do as much to enhance value to the equation as possible. And I'm gonna describe some ways I think we can achieve that. Here's the last one on my list. Current frameworks being challenged. Agile, Kanban, even Waterfall itself in terms of meaningful nature. Scaled Agile framework was a big discussion earlier this year. You know, is it even legit anymore? I went to a couple conferences earlier this year and the top category of involvement was Agile Manifesto. Do we need to iterate on it now? It's only been around for X number of years and already people are challenging it to say, is it meaningful? Working software over comprehensive documentation, responding to change over following a plan. Why is quality exempt from that conversation? Why do we think that quality is sacred and protected and just gonna be absorbed into what next methodology we're gonna do and it's, of course it's gonna be there. We should have the guts to challenge our strategy and what we're doing with quality and is it meaningful now? So I took a stab at that. I said, okay, let's look at the origin, the quality word, the definition of it. And I went back to ISO and I looked and I think, Johanna, you covered this as well in your talk when you started digging into the principles of the Agile Manifesto and found that those were often more meaningful in application than the manifesto itself. I found the same to be true for ISO. And I, they had seven principles buried in there for quality management. And I looked at those and I said, okay, test. Litmus test. Is it meaningful? Can we apply these today? Let's challenge these. If they're not, let's iterate them. Let's run through them real quick, because I think you'll find, as I did, I think they're pretty meaningful. Number one, customer focus. Big surprise. That's like the mantra of quality right now. Primary focus of quality management is to meet customer requirements and strive to exceed expectations. Again, customer is broad here, and we should apply that principle to not only external clients, and, but our internal stakeholders as well. We're meeting a need. Number two, leadership. Leaders at all levels establish unity of purpose, direction, create conditions with people are engaged in achieving quality. Funny they didn't use the word management there. Remember Peter's talk on the keynote? Leadership is definitely something we can apply today and use those principles in our quality engagement, putting together our plans to have groups solve what's in front of us, the challenges. Third, engagement of people. It's essential for the organization that all people are competent, empowered, engaged in delivering value. Value, not quality. Already there, they're talking about if you apply quality principles, value will be the outcome. And that's, I think, definitely a key focus now process approach. 
Consistent and predictable results are achieved more effectively and efficiently when activities are understood and managed as interrelated processes that function as a coherent system. Improvement. There's that continuous integration word all the way back then, CI. Successful organizations have ongoing focus. So continuous integration becoming continuous delivery and continuous deployment is one example, but there's others of that. And that's stated right there in the ISO principles. Last one, evidence-based decision-making. Decisions based on the analysis and evaluation of data and information are more likely to produce desired results. Of course, our metrics and results need to be meaningful and contextual in where we're going. So how do we position ourselves to understand and move forward? Let's be proactive and less reactive. How do we do that? Okay, now I'm gonna start talking about some of the perceptions and some of the comments that others have made in solving this dilemma. Some are based on years ago, some are recent, and so I wanna step through those real quick and kinda of paint a picture, and a lot of them you guys have seen already, and some of them are gonna go, wow, that thought is still out there. The most obvious, dev equals test. One of the more recent re definitions of that is shift left. It's a great idea. And as, as a part of the solution, I think it's, it's a good one. I think a lot of organizations are putting too much emphasis on that being the center of the target and putting a lot of expectation around what that action and system will put together. So what does that mean? I mean, obviously, the, you get the, the dynamic there, which is a healthy one. What does this mean? It could mean developers take more ownership and responsibility of the code. It could mean we're gonna challenge requirements earlier. It could mean business users and users acceptance get aligned with development expectations earlier. It could mean no testing. It could mean no testers. I've seen that. I've actually Im implemented that, where we called everyone on the team a developer, period. You're on a team, you own quality. Now, in doing so, I made sure that the me mechanics and what needed to become a, as a definition of done and outputs, and also the job descriptions and expectations were carefully managed so that there was expertise and instructions on that. Setting that expectation just flat out would have a lot more consequences and gaps. And there's other ways to mitigate that as well, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later as we look for ways to add value to the whole picture when using this kind of model. But that's one approach. There's no best practice, there's no cookie cutter. This is one approach people have used to try and solve the complexity of do more with less, time to market, communication, okay? Just start. Now, I, I told you guys I'm a musician and creative guy, right? So this is where I take a pit stop. As I was going through this deck, I ran across a lot of graphics and pictures and I ran across some things that were just flat out funny, so I'm gonna share one. This one just struck me as just, okay, that's simple. But I like the next one even better. <laughs> We've all seen this. So I was uh, laughing to myself when I dug through that. I said, let's share that one. Okay, back on track. So how about let's define what our quality roadmap looks like. Let's put this in a career path. So I'm gonna set expectations and levels of engagement and what it means to be a tester. I saw this from a company called Abstracta. They do have uh, uh, regions in South America as well as America. And they put together an infographic that talked about the career path of a tester, starting with test executor, designer, test case design. Now we're gonna to go to senior tester, specialization, testing techniques, technical tester, kind of getting into more of the DevOps automation, specialized, and then there's your target. Organizes, coordinates test-driven uh, testing activities and test manager. And I saw that and I'm going, okay, that's one approach. Let's define coverage. And, and I, I think too many organizations are putting this box around what it means to test and what it means to have that function in an organization. I think quality needs to be a noun, not an output of assigned activities. I think this kind of thinking in isolation can produce that. Again, 
it's, it's one step where people try and solve that. Get certified, you know, to, you know, you know, stay focused on that. And I think we need to get ready to be more broad in the impact that quality and testing in these activities have in the larger picture. Cora. I don't know how many of you subscribe to that. There's a lot of interesting ideas, comments. And I was reading this particular one a couple weeks ago. It says, the future testing is still going to require those with technical and professional knowledge. But delivery management will also still have this perception that anyone can do it. And that's going to stay that way. And just like in iterations in years past, we're going to get through the next five years, and this will still be there, and we're going to survive with this mindset that testing at a rudimentary level is a contract assigned activity that we can throw bodies at and get it done when we need to. I thought it was an interesting approach because if you look backwards over time, there's some degree where I could see that conclusion being made. I'm not going to disagree with that. But I think to set the expectation that the next five years are going to be on a linear trajectory of the previous Iteration of software development, I think, is a misnomer. I think that would be the wrong way to look at this, and I think we'd be a little bit disappointed if we had expectations for the next few years based on the last few. I think we need to assert the specialization and the value of quality going forward instead of letting the cycle continue. Mont Valesky, I don't know how many of you guys have read any articles from him, and I came across something that he wrote in 2011. Joel's from a, a company called Practitest, and it's multinational based in Israel. And he said this, our unwillingness to defer or delay gratification is at the core of the technology innovations fueling delivery expectations. Our unwillingness to defer gratification is fueling technology and at the core of it. And you know, I was thinking about that. I think there's a lot of truth to that. And if we use that as a context to what the customer and client community has becoming, I think we could wrap our heads around it and give it a thought. This is a provocative talk. It's not meant to be the nail and on that, but I'm going to give you some quick examples and flip through this real quick. One of the examples was food sources. Okay, agriculture, first recorded restaurant in China, if refrigerator comes into the picture, notice the time difference between these shrinking. And the refrigerator comes in, frozen dinners, a manna comes out with this microwave oven thing, and uh, now we can't live without them. Soon after that, Doppler radar, satellite thermal imaging, soil analysis, these are accelerating along with technology for that need to say, we want food, we want it different, we want it faster, we want it more diverse, down to the intricacy of that. In this article in 2011, Joel made this prediction that very soon we were going to enter an era like Star Trek. Replicator. Earl Grey. It's here. Digital 3D printing is now producing food. Hershey is digital printing food. They've already started. There's a company, uh, a group conglomerate in Europe that is, for medicine purposes, taking soft substance food and digital printing these with color and flavor characteristics to make them more enjoyable <coughs> For the, for, the, um, for the consumers, for those that need that medical need. It's happening. That's the onset. Now we need to figure out how to do it faster, better, cheaper, scalable, widespread. I think that's the start of that. And it's not taking the form we thought it would take, where it's these electrons fusing together to take something, but it's not that far off base. Our unwillingness to defer gratification is driving technology. Okay, here's another one. Communications, messaging gratification. We were talking this morning, Rex was like, yeah, how often you know, we're gonna put ourselves at risk doing this across the street. So, same cycle. We used to go by courier, <coughs> pigeons, telegraph, Morse code. We get the telephone, cell phone, of course, internet. That fuels a whole bunch of stuff, right? Now messaging is multi-dimensionals, and 
uh, Minority Report. Those sensors and activities are available now with a combination of facial recognition, GPS, and other profiling have targeted ads and messaging in select markets. So what's next? BCI, CBI are now acronyms commonly used in technological innovation and delivery. Brain to computer interface, computer to brain interface. Those prototypes are already out there being tested. You can go Google it, look for pictures, look for studies. That's the customer expectation. That's what's fueling this. And I'm gonna show you some slides a little bit later here where the billions of dollars that are being invested are gonna shift gears into the consumer side. So, building the right thing and building it right the first time, you've gotta embed quality. We know this into every part of the cycle. But I think we need to start having the mindset that it's more than just quality assurance. Quality, we can, we can build a framework that delivers high quality support for the infrastructure and the product or service that we're going after if we, if we play our cards right and look at some indicators and look at framing what we're going after the right way. This goes a little bit beyond UX and CX. So this is what I'm gonna start diving into now. I'm gonna go into uh, some, but I wanna bring up something that I thought was kinda of interesting. This is my personal viewpoint. Now you can see if you agree with me or not. I think the technological landscape is becoming so complex that we can relate it to this guy, Einstein. Theory of relativity. Let's review that real quick. Two events simultaneous for one observer may not be simultaneous for another observer if the observers are in relative motion. That's mind bending. And yet, the way that we're instrumenting platforms and technology and going with connected devices and kind of like a framework of its own where we let machine decisions and results generate as a result of what we've implemented but not necessarily output comes to this kind of conclusion. I think connected devices as a service, the Internet of Things is expanding the potential of what can be implemented just like the Big Bang Theory. And it is going to be possible, and we're experiencing that today, where customer expectations from a platform or grouping of data or services can have different outcomes and still be part of what we delivered as a solution. Simultaneously. Now, there's some tech, I mean, you can get into the details of that and go, okay, well, if you break this apart, we could probably find some finesse. But the experience and the mind that go into, into that, I think, I think it gets to that level of complexity. So, what are the puzzle pieces? Let's start, let's start decomposing this a little bit. This isn't an exhaustive view, but I'm just gonna hit some things that caught my attention and let's see where we go with this. How are we doing on time here? Okay, I'm gonna run through the first one real quick here and then take a pause ahead of schedule. And uh, I don't know, we'll just go up, I probably hit the break here and we'll just uh, let people phase in. The most obvious is connected devices. So let's understand this a little bit more. By the year 2020, we're gonna have six billion mobile phones, but 30 billion connected smart devices taking 42% of the mobile bandwidth. There's a shift from proprietary devices to proprietary data underlying that. And we need to understand, I was mentioning at a table earlier, data is key. To understand quality, we need to start putting quality around our usage of test data and understanding production data. And this is a big reason why, because we're all going to be embedded in the connected device sphere of things at some point, and we need to understand this. Here's another view of that. Internet of Everything 2015. Same prediction, by the way. It's relatively, that one said 36, uh, 36 billion. This one's around the same one. Look at the trend of Internet of Things, though, relative to the other wearables, tablets, smartphones, and PCs. Another thing that I noticed, and this gets uh, to some of the security concerns. Last month there was a security conference, I believe it was in Las Vegas. And they found in this seminar 
66 new zero-day vulnerabilities across 27 different device types and 18 different manufacturers. This is today's technology, privilege escalation, remote code execution, runs as root, lack of encryption, plain text passwords, key exposure, the list goes on. That's serious. And that's impacting our ability to assess risk and coverage as we start embedding that more. Yeah, your Fitbit just became your digital wallet. <laughs> to in the right hands. That's real. Okay, here's the budget. So looking at the trend here, Internet of Things endpoint spending by category in billions of dollars. Business and IT-centric spending accounts for the majority running through 2016. But look what happens here in 2020. Consumer. The trend here, basically, from Gartner last year says that consumer spending is going to eclipse even the billions of dollars that enterprise IT put into connected devices in terms of innovation and spending. And now you know who your customer is. That's what's going to be fueling this. There's that deferred gratification that they cannot do without that's going to fuel this. And all of a sudden, they're going to have a stronger voice because the money's behind it. There's another factor I want to consider here. I was telling this to Doug earlier. As a result of this trend and needing to account for this kind of spending and this number of devices, I was reading a report, and I don't know if it was from Gartner or another IT journal. I wish I could remember the source. I'll try and dig that up. CTOs and CIOs are getting a new agenda on their radar to account for in the next coming years. And this is what it is. They're creating a new division, a new emphasis. All of us have lived most of our lives understanding what IT is, information technology. It's that moniker, it's that overarching parachute that covers all things information technology. There's a new one coming. OT, operational technology. They're starting to make business units separate from IT to account for the security and risks and integration of connected devices, both as digital business within how they do business, as well as the integration with connected and any to any connectivity. And the prediction, as they're starting to make it, is that IT and OT are going to coexist in the larger digital footprint and landscape. Who knew? We've been IT centric for so long, now we've got a now we've got a play buddy. Think about it. It's coming. And with our skill set and mindset and quality strategy, we've got the kind of, of ability, I think, as professionals to be an asset to the organization at large and how to deal with this and start solving problems. So why OT? Why, why the need for that? Here's one view. Machine to machine, all the different categories that this could possibly fill in. It's probably hard to see from back there, and I wasn't trying to draw attention to the microtext, but you know, just between IT networks being one sector, security, retail, transportation, industrial, healthcare, consumer, energy, buildings. When I was at uh, Avanade as group manager over cloud solutions, this sector, industrial, two of our largest enterprise clients were mining companies. And to the degree they were using uh, connected devices as a catalyst to their metrics and understanding the weight of the trucks per location and where they were traveling to and tablet devices accounting for personnel and changes and supply orders was gargantuan. They're very much relying on that and being key innovators in that technology for that expertise in business and depending on that going forward. Okay, last slide and then we'll, uh, we'll run into this. This is a graph that Gartner came out last year as well, talking about the plateau of productivity. Basically putting a map together of different innovations and technologies and putting maybe a two year, five year, 10 year curve on how quickly they are accelerating to a degree of productivity. Internet of Things, connected devices, and those kind of wearables are only three of those buttons there. Big bang. 
This is going crazy. I've only mentioned a few to account for. There's a lot out there. And these will come, pick up or diminish in relative value next to each other. Last slide before the break. Okay, we talked enough about Internet of Things. It's so one more component I think we need to pay attention to, and it's a little side player that not you know, too many people are noticing right now, Raspberry Pi. I think similar to connected devices, Raspberry Pi innovation is going to create a much wider user base for manipulating data and services. Remember that earlier graphic I showed you about consumer spending and innovation and that being a very key driver in billions of dollars for connected devices? I think that's a key catalyst to keep an eye on. It's not the only game in town, but it's definitely an influencer worldwide. Those are jigsaw pieces that I'm putting together and why we should be taking this seriously and getting creative and using, using our innovation to go after where we're going. So we're going to take a break. And then what I'm going to do is on the second half of this, I'm going to take some of the trends and kind of the things that have gotten our brains thinking a little bit, and I'm going to put those together in tangible. Okay, we're on a quality team. We're in an organization. We're testing. We're trying to figure out how to do this ourselves better, more effectively, add value to the equation. I'm going to draw those out. So hopefully you can join me. So let's take 10 minutes. Go from there. Thanks. We're going to recap real quick here. What we talked about leading up to this, and I'll just go over it real quick. We talked about the definition of quality. It's roots back in philosophical between Socrates and Plato, asking, well, if I'm inclined to buy product or service and I have a need for it and can afford it, does that necessarily think it was a quality product I received? Debatable. Um, some of the main pressures emerging that make quality just flat hard on top of, you know, time, market. ISO principles, we talked about those being very meaningful uh, in terms of how to achieve principles of quality going forward, similar to the Agile principles. Not just looking at the manifesto itself, but digging into the covers. What others have said about trying to attack the complexity of quality relative to software delivery with emerging markets. We talked about people not willing to defer gratification as being a core driver, uh, fueling technology. We looked at indicators like connected devices, Internet of Things, and what a major role that's going to play going forward that we need to account for. So now I'm going to start going into a little bit. OK, so what can we focus on? And I'm going to kind of get bigger and bigger starting with some small, obvious, and, and grow on that on some of, the, some of the tools, if you will, based on what we talked about previously leading up to this point. So first one, I'm going to stay kind of obvious, testing. What does it mean? How are we defining it? I think the term testing is getting fuzzy in today's delivery, in this framework and methodology. We all know process and framework isn't implemented the way it is on SlideShare or PDF, right? And different businesses have taken this a different way. But I think too many organizations are content to develop assets and maintain those assets as a testing test cases, like Rex was talking about earlier. What's the number of test cases? What's the number of bugs? And keeping it in that frame. We need to be proactive defining testing. Even if it's already been done, taking that hard look like we talked about earlier and saying, is it relevant now the way we define that? Is it scalable to where we need to take coverage and quality into the next level? How's this suggestion? Why don't you take the term manual testing and replace it with functional testing or exploratory testing? I think those terms are more indicative of the skill and expertise required for those activities. Just that sh subtle shift can have a leadership influential effect in the organization and those kind of things like that. Okay, strategy. The biggest communication problem is that we do not listen to understand, we listen to reply. 
I didn't make that quote. That's been out there. Number one, have a strategy. Look for it. If there isn't one, create one. Work with your team, work with your organization. Let's talk about strategy planning and meetings and working with development and operations and PMO and those assets. We talked a little bit about that this morning with Rex Black, where if you are in a design planning strategy session and you've come up with all the ways that a concept cannot succeed or has too many, con you know, too many elements to be sustainable, don't wait until the very meeting to present that idea and lay it all out on the line. Yes, you were invited to the strategy meeting. Yes, that's very cool that your organization has evolved to that point. But be strategic even in that context. Have dialogues prior. Discuss those hypotheses. Make sure there's a team approach and vision and start working on a solution. Same for test results. If you see a trend or spike where someone's going to get dinged in a meeting and something's gone off the rails, have that discussion prior saying, are you seeing the same trend I am? Are we looking at the same root cause analysis? What can we do to partner in terms of a solution or get more data surrounding that? And all of a sudden you're coming to those meetings saying, we've talked about this and we have a solution at least to gather more data, understand it more, or try and re remedy the situation. What the data is telling us. That's strategy. Always remember the context of quality before you present a message that affirms or criticizes what is being done about it. Quality plus context always equals what we're going after. It's never quality by itself, never metrics by itself. Okay? Remember the ISO principles we talked about? People? Doc Norton did a talk, I think three years ago, at PNSQC in one of the, I think it was the Monday, Tuesday evening session. And he talked about T-shaped people. And that is a very influential, very strategic element to advocate, is what you're looking for and how you should be running your teams and looking for it. The principle is this, that we were looking for people that have depth of experience, expertise, developers, testers, UX, architects, right? And that's very much a desired <laughs> skill and something we strive for, to have that specialty. But we also need people that understand the context of the different specialties and roles and can wear multiple hats on a team or organization. And having those kind of people to bridge that is called a T-shaped person model. If you're going to invest and you're going to be ready for the complexity that's coming, take a look at this and say, what am I doing in terms of mentoring our teams, job descriptions, even expectation setting within your teams, achieving this model? And what if the quality personnel are some of the key drivers for this kind of thinking if you're not implementing it already? Looks like a dollar sign to me. Value. Okay. We've heard this term a lot. Test-driven development. Different ways to implement it. Behavior-driven, acceptance, test-driven development. There's all different ways and context. And again, there's that word, context. What's applicable to our platform or service or customer model? You know, where can, we, where can we achieve the best results with that? What I want to emphasize here, though, is that where the quality team can come into, into view and where I think the quality is going to raise in value is in the self-documenting side of this equation. I think one of the, the key features of a test-driven development or acceptance test-driven development model is the self-documenting nature of that. And I think with the complexity going forward, I think, in my opinion, that's going to raise as an asset to the organization because we've got to figure out how to be multi-loaded in the way that we're approaching things here. And the resulting asset that's created with self-documenting and understanding what we're delivering and what the expectations, at least even from a capability perspective, 
I think are gonna raise in value. So we should take a look at this, even the way that if we're doing it already and seeing if we're developing that asset correctly and it's being used by the organization. Um, for those of you, uh, Matt was wanting to come to this talk, Matt Griscom, he's got a book called Meta Automation and he's doing a talk right now. And I'd encourage you to look at his documentation, some of his models. Uh, he's got an augment to this about self-documenting hierarchical check steps um, that I think could, for some of us, be another way of looking at this and maybe offering some models that might uh, help us develop that even more in our organizations. So I'll give him a plug on that because I think he's got a, a component there that would be useful in developing this. Data. It's important. And we could spend a whole couple sessions this long talking about just the elements of data and it's important to understand it. I'm going to get into a little bit more details of steps that we can take in our organization to remember test data management and its importance. More than ever, we need to be intentional about the ways data impacts our need to have the product or platform function as well as understanding how it's being used versus how it was designed or what the specification states it should do. On the bottom there, I've got a hypothetical exponential view of just how that can add up in the experience there. You've got initial data. This is like a basic connected device in a car. Current vehicle position, weather, traffic, the driver itself, who is driving, where's your destination, right? Okay, your common stuff. Now aggregate, multiply that by analyze data. Okay, what's your distance from the start? Ongoing, time to distance destination, traffic weather updates, real-time changes to target. Now take that body and multiply it by the actions and conclusions being made at every step in millisecond or whatever that ratio is for decisions. State, points in time, alerts, cataloging. And that's one thread. What's our data? Do we understand it? Do we understand how the customers are using our data? Do we understand how you, customers are interacting with the data we're making already available to them. We had a scenario that we worked for months on a very key feature uh, on a cloud solutions platform to realize that at the end of the day, the customers, enterprise grade customers, weren't using that feature because they didn't believe in it or they didn't, weren't aware that it was capable of the speed and within 5% variance of the, of the native model. And we only found that out after looking at the system saying, well, let's put a control in there to see who's using it natively and who's going through our system. And then we found out, okay, we need some work to do. And by the way, the help desk, help desk was broken there anyway, so that's aggravating the problem as they click in to find out the capability. So let's fix that too. Start with production as many ways as you possibly can, but and look at the data underneath it, instrument ways to look at that. Areas and test coverage. We all love looking at graphs, pie charts, our own analytics, not just the ones from ALM. There's a lot of capability and there's a lot we can derive out of test coverage. We need to take a look at that going forward because it's gonna get harder to do as we start converging areas by necessity, either by the time that we're given to analyze it or the fact that um, app testing, service testing can get part of the same equation in a really big hurry. Sometimes out of necessity, sometimes just from a timing perspective. And let's look at new targets, extensibility. What about, how do you measure that capability? That's what the customers are expecting. That's part of the package of what we're delivering. How are we gonna metric that, measure that, display that? trend, graph that. There's a technique that's been around for a while, and I was just recently exposed to it, called critical to quality, CTQ. And we use this as a common mechanism between Avanade and Microsoft to provide a, a core set of measurable outcomes and expectations derived from a select 
set of features and requirements, capabilities. In short, you're taking basically the feature stories and you're finding the ones that are the most critical and measurable, key element there. They have to have an attribute that has a range of measurement and you publish those right up front. This is what we're measuring and these are gonna be key indicators, KPIs from a test coverage perspective, a capability perspective, meeting our goals of iterations. CTQ, look into that. I, I found it to be a nice bridge to start defining what are the right metrics, right test coverages, right expectations that are measurable to set to get indicators on what you're achieving as a team, as a platform, as a, as a group. Now this is interesting. My battery is running low at 14%, which means what I plugged into here had the appearance of being on, but maybe not. That's hilarious. Let's see if this works. We're going to find out if this shuts down anytime soon. <laughs> I'm glad the computer told me. That's happy. It's blinking, so that means it's charging now, probably. All right, let's hope it is. HP gets kudos for that one. Okay. Next slide. Metrics. There's a big one. Another one we could spend a whole session on. As a matter of fact, we did this morning. Rick Splack gave some <coughs> excellent perspectives on what's important about metrics, how to avoid stupid tricks. Metrics are one of the key pieces of our quality strategy. Evidence-based decision-making, it's a core principle. We need to have the courage to re-examine the metrics that we're doing. Is it meaningful, is it relevant, like we talked about earlier? Even if trends have been already established months and leading up to that, because I think we need to be, have the courage to say, maybe trends are changing. Maybe we need to take a subset of that and add on to it. How about this? How about defining a definition of done, doneness relative to the bi bigger picture? I know that sounds agile and like everyone should say, well, yeah, definition of done, but you'd be surprised how many people don't have an effective definition of done. Or what I've seen occur is even in waterfall methodology or iterative, that test strategy document, I've seen the definition, the exit criteria modeled after Agile to be much more effective even at that context setting expectations for how to get people aligned to what we need to get to that phase and to move on and to prevent re rework. Again, a powerful tool used the right way. And throw metrics around that, it's measurable. It's agreed upon, it's a standard set. Develop metrics that show the cost of test, including rework, test data delivery, and usage. Metrics that show production incidents by feature, as well as metrics that show effectiveness of delivery and feature utilization. Frame even your incidents in production to be a value and help expedite getting to root cause analysis or trending by feature team or rework being done by the teams. What about measure the manual effort? We actually started doing this and we were amazed at the value of that one particular metric. For each sprint and collection, look at the manual effort that's being delivered. What are we putting expectations on from a DevOps and sustainability perspective to config, deploy, and maintain that from a manual perspective that's not automated? First of all, you know your risk, you know, fat finger, right? But second, then you create Another metric alongside it saying, what are we doing? At what rate are we taking care of this technical debt? What can be automated as a result of that? What are we considering? Are we designing it the right way to allow for eventual automation of that? Or are we just forcing ourselves into a manual category that's aggregating larger and larger over time? Some very interesting results will happen when you've got the guts to measure that. Value. That's when you start getting into that you know what, we know what the problem can be if we allow it to happen. Let's start putting some meaningful measure around that. Who thought of that? Yeah, the quality team. Or it was a quality output from a combined 
dev equals test group. Doesn't matter, they get the credit. Okay, my battery is now at 11%. This is funny. Hey, Tim, let's figure out what's going on here. Did we lose power in here? Because at some point here, do these just need to be turned on? Yeah, these have all lost power here, so we're, we're not getting feed to any of this. If you could get an extension cord or something, that'd be awesome, or figure out a hotline to get here. And the show goes on. We'll see how long we'll make this work. And I didn't account for this, but we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna make it happen. Good thing I'm running this at max brightness, huh? So I can see it. Okay. Let's start talking about. That's cool. Put that in my pocket now. Value. I talked about that earlier, so let's start putting some mechanics around that. What's the value of quality? So another set of values that sometimes we forget to look at. Again, everyone knows Scrum, but I think a less percentage actually go into the values of Scrum. And what are some of the reoccurring themes? It's not included as part of Scrum officially, but these values give direction to our work, behavior, actions. It's the way we implement the practices, these activities. Everything we do around it should enforce these values. Okay? It's awesome. Commitment, focus, openness, respect, courage. What values do we have in quality? I actually went searching for this before this talk, and I didn't find very many. We don't have the same framework. There's a lot of different perspectives, but I didn't find something like this besides the ISO principles and others. So let's talk about it. We did this in the first session. Let's take a couple minutes, discuss among yourselves. If, if possible, in one word, what's a value of quality? Similar to the scrum values. Let's take a couple minutes, discuss that, and we'll uh, write up some ideas. That's from Scott. Oh, they're both good. Awesome, it's brighter. Thank you, Tim. Oh. Quality. Like, just like the scrum has values. So you're, you mean some of these um, kind of esoteric, touchy-feely values be part if, of If they're touchy-feely to you, Phil. Yeah? It's, it's, it's a value. It's something that aligns and we center our work as quality professionals around. When we say we're quality management, right. quality software, what's that value of that methodology? Okay. You mean the value that you have to hold within yourself in right. order to be a... The value you have to hold within yourself in order to do the job properly. Right. As opposed to the as value of what you're that, delivering. That's correct. Okay, got it. That's correct. We're using this approach, and this is our focus because. That's actually one of the ones I picked. Are you, are you, did you see my deck prior to this? Okay. You're gonna laugh. We are so on the same page, literally. <laughs> Keep going.
Okay, a couple, couple more seconds. Our quality activities should reinforce these values, emphasize them, not diminish or undermine them. What are those? Okay, whiteboard again. Let's, let's toss them out in the back there. What do we got? Trustworthy? Okay. Integrity. Joanna. Honesty. Honesty. Flow. Say it again. Flow. 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 Not blocking. Okay. Any more? Satisfaction. Satisfaction. Not only from our work in the output, but the end result and customer perspective. Pride of ownership. Pride of ownership. Confidence. Speed and stability. Okay. Curiosity. What's the word? Curiosity. Curiosity. Usefulness. Usefulness. One more. Consistent. Consistent. Trustworthy, flow, not blocking, integrity, satisfaction, honesty, pride of ownership, confidence, speed, stability, curiosity, usefulness, consistent. It's a quite a wide map. Are our activities centric around those in our quality processes? Delivery, where we say this needs to be quality X. Is the way we're assembling data and feedback trustworthy? Consistent. Do our activities arouse, probably the wrong word. <laughs> 2016. 2016, right, flow with it. Uh, cur curiosity, exploration, root cause, double click. It's used in Microsoft a lot. This is great. I'm gonna take a. I'm gonna take a picture of that. So, I put some together, and I, let's see how. Let's see where I went with this. Meaningful. Yes, it's kind of a value. Metrics, data, coverage mm -hmm. is meaningful in the context. Objective. Risk and consideration from all perspectives, user, operation, development, so the list goes on. Kind of like flow, not blocking. Honesty, consistent, trustworthy. Those kind of relate to that. Transparency. Don't be a filter. Let strong communication drive decisions to the role needed. Sustainable. That's where I kind of tried to put trust and integrity together in the same word. But that's really the output that we're looking for. There's more. We should develop our own and make our framework around that. That can drive a lot of leadership, a lot of
positive traction towards the quality mindset in our organizations if we have values associated with the reason we're doing quality in the first place. And probably sustain ourselves, quite honestly, when it gets hard, which it does. Okay. Thank you for the feedback on that. So what's another area we need to focus on? <laughs> Customer. What does that mean? Remind ourselves that the clients and customer focus on the experience, not the features. More and more that is going to become the target, the goal, what we need to measure, what we need to keep in mind, what's going to change out from under us as there's rapid feedback from the client or customer base. Features in, con in, in concert influence and drive a positive experience, not the features alone. That needs to be the top of our list, or up there in terms of priority going forward as we plan. So I want to talk about DevOps and that culture a little bit as we look at ways to add value to the equation as quality professionals and where we're going next as this gets complex. So we all pretty much know this one. Dev and QA, uh, Dev and Ops, that synergy. Right? It's that feedback loop, fast response, understanding what these guys are driving for, feedback. I'm not going to go into the mechanics of DevOps alone there. I think we're pretty familiar with those that have been there. And then I've seen recent things like this. Okay? Well, let's add quality into the ring. Seen some of these diagrams. Okay, let's account for quality in that. I think it gets a little fuzzier from what I've read on how, and the, you know, they, it's, I think we've got a good start on where quality is part of that equation and kept in mind. Some would say, well, isn't, isn't QA embedded in dev if you've made development responsible for quality in that model of agile or centric teams? That's how it started. But again, that value proposition of having a quality strategy and mindset and activities around that. I think this model allows more direct feedback to product ownership. And done correctly, I think we can expand that to have a larger impact and role into the DevOps culture and really become a quality culture centric as well. I'm not saying this is, this, is, this, is a, this is a dream here, trust me. But I think with the right mechanics, we can leverage this model and be leaders, like Peter was talking about yesterday, and demonstrate where we can go influencing making this even more stronger to the organization. So how do we do this? CIO priorities. Frame those into your quality plan. Understand what production operations looks like and be a catalyst in driving those back, not only to the de delivery teams, but to the product owners as we're framing product roadmaps and features. That can be huge value, especially in enterprise grade rapid feedback models, getting feedback on what production looks like. I'm amazed still at the number of consulting engagements I go to where I ask, have you asked the operations folks how they measure production? And are you testing any of that the same way in your non-production environments? It seems like a no-brainer when I state it that way. And I understand that there's challenges from, from policy and uh, the mechanics, you know, people and, and their focus to do that. But at the end of the day, we need to be catalysts to allow that reality to happen more often than not. And that's that part of that QA equation that gets bigger there. So what about feedback on the way clients and customers are using or not using the product or platform? Here's the one. 
test from the API and UX at the same time. That's effective. Let's look for ways that we can do that. But understand the product roadmap and place emphasis on those dependencies, features, and data capabilities. Maybe that's better. Have that mindset and input into the equation on how things are being done. Take one and catapult it to the next level. Are we counting for serverless platforms? Microservices are growing. Are we, do we understand how to manage and config cloud? Do you understand the mechanics that need to go into sustaining that? and translating those into how we're implementing not only our test coverage, but design considerations and architecture. We're part of that equation if we're sharing the quality roadmap and, and being that catalyst and driver in our organizations. Learn how to test, report, and prove on robustness. Capability of the team to deliver and sustain is just as valuable, in my opinion, if not more so than the SLA measurement itself. I think that's something we need to keep in mind going forward. You see this kind of boilerplate, okay, service level agreement, live service, test for that. What about robustness in general of the system? Consider that. I think your CIO and others in the technology leadership would appreciate that perspective and probably have a really good discussion about it. Culture of quality includes efficiency, added value. What about what you can't automate? It's a lot of it out there. It's no surprise to any of us saying, okay, that's kind of tough to do. So now what? Why don't you automate the measurement of usage recording where your policy allows it instead? We've all seen Selenium, we've all seen record a script and we do it ourselves on the testing side. Why don't we take that mindset and apply those instrumentation where we can't automate to draw out the traction of how the customers are using and flow into the system? That's one of the ways we found that earlier issue of the operations team bypassing this capability that we work so hard to implement because they believe that the, the native provisioning for cloud services was going to be more effective and uh, they were more familiar with it anyways. They weren't even using that flow, not triggering our business logic, providing them the catalog to provision that because they were just going to the native because that's that's what they felt comfortable with. And they believed ours was slower to X percentage. We were able to track that by figuring out, okay, who's triggering this flow? This is our expectation based on expectation. Now, how are they really doing it? That's value. And everyone's gonna have a different context of, okay, well, what, what dollar sign does that have? And is it sustainable? And I know there's no perfect picture there, but we need to start thinking about that and having a pro-con decisive decision out of it rather than expecting that someone else will take care of it. Or that's the way complexity is gonna cause us to think. And we'll be better at our craft if we do that. Okay, talked a little bit about data. I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail now. Data 2.0, whatever. It's important. I think we need to frame our expectations around it being important going forward as we hit 2020. The quality program of the future is going to need a matrix per, matrixed perspective of the data it's using to create maximum value for the effort. This is three views, if you will, before I get into some of the mechanics of just data management as a refresher. Think of it from this perspective, people, the user community and providers using the product or platform. Technology, the expectations and dependencies of the product or platform. And then third, process, delivery of service of the product or platform. These are three views, perspectives into the quality underlying. Characteristics, attributes, qualities. By deliberately understanding production data, we can spend less time justifying what data to use and more time validating a delivered solution. And having the quality team reinforces, yeah, having the quality team doing this reinforces that value proposition that I'm talking about. 
I'll bet we've got people at least wired to this or we can accrue that. So let's break down. A lot of you familiar with test data management know these. I'll just reiterate them here for this talk and we'll be in the notes. Number one, determine and classify. I talk about this at lunchtime with the table about, okay, where do we get data from? How do we, what's our first step in, in getting understanding? Determine and classify. I'm amazed still to this day how often this step is missed with the goal of creating the data itself in aggregate. Not only sources, but types, variants, security policy, data flow. Ideally, that's what you want to understand. Identify your data. Understand why you need it, what you expect from it to begin with before creating it. Even if you already have production data, what is it? Classify it. Develop and get. Things like quantity of data, what qualifies as mock and stub, conversion and encryption strategies, those are all important elements of how you're gonna develop the data that you need. Don't forget researching performance extracts. How, you know, how long is it gonna take to extract that initial data before you obfuscate it? How many different sources are you gonna have on that? Even before you do the first validation run. Populate and use then. Okay, how are we gonna load it? Who owns it? Where's that matrix of, you know, racy? Storage needs. So many organizations miss the disconnect between identified data and dependencies to store, migrate, and host that data. Make sure you take a step back and ensure scenario and end-to-end -end flows are accounted for. And then, now you're into maintenance mode. Refresh, retention, baselining, all important. Data quality, it's a data asset at that point that you can build on and count as value going forward if you've taken the steps to invest in that at whatever level you mature enough to go for and iterate. Self-service, there's a bonus. Self-service model where data can be refreshed. That's not always possible in every situation, but that's an idea to say, why can't we or where can't we? Have that conversation, understand that limitation. Okay, I've only got a few more to go here and then we'll, we'll wrap up here. So where else can we add value if we're looking for ways to do that? Here's an interesting one. What about problem identification? Why not? What better expertise and experience do you think to problem solving? Why is it out of bounds to be consultants in our organizations where we need to identify and decompose problems? Those with a quality background are best suited for a systematic approach to problem decomposition and facilitating faster resolution. So let's look for ways to empower our organizations and use our expertise that we already have kind of as a mindset on how we approach things and augment that to problem identification and helping speed resolution in general be consultants with our own system. I've seen this done. It's an asset and a power that we have that we've developed and sophisticated as a profession. And oftentimes we limit it to root cause analysis on bugs. It's important. Don't get me wrong, I'm not diminishing that, but why don't we expand that circle like I showed a little bit more and add value to our organization with something we've become really good at. I've been doing jokes here and there, so here's another one. It's a Dilbert classic. <laughs> I laughed when I saw the word COBOL. Okay, I mentioned something earlier in the first section. So value versus what? Cost center. How do we differentiate that? 
What can we do to try and get rid of that stigma, that trap, assumption, whatever that is? Time to market delivery complexity is not making it easier to sustain a quality program or focus with intention. It's not. It's not linear. It's not going to stay the same for a few years. So what can we do about it? I'm going to mention four different sections here. Reduce handoff cost and measure effectiveness of continuous delivery. Having process established is a great milestone. I'm not diminishing that at all, but measuring the effectiveness of this takes value and efficiency to a new level. For instance, do you see data queries exponentially go up as a result of the delivered system where that wasn't intended? Or a number of uh, exceptions come back rapidly. Number two. When quality program understands and proactively supports product roadmap, more product services will be sold. Use the strategy planning data metrics elements discussed earlier to allow execs and product owners to make informed prioritization choices that will position your features better in the marketplace. Who's driving that quality team? Adjust attributes and incident coding so a quality event gets traced back to providing value and not just absorbed into the engineering backlog. I've, a lot of places do this already to some degree. Look at ways of improving that. Look at ways of putting trending in terms of feature teams and you know, say right off the bat, here's an aggregate, here's an event that's being categorized. Unscheduled changes, number of logs being written. There will always be bugs, people will make mistakes. Providing solutions, solutions using cloud, introducing scaling service challenges, automating repeatable processes. I talked about that earlier, about emphasizing repeatable processes, measuring the manual effort being delivered and making sure we address that technical debt. So, last slide. The very definition of quality is having a grade of excellence. The more distinctive and essential something is, the better we're able to satisfy stated or implied needs. What did I just say? Implied needs? Yeah. That's that capability, extensibility stuff we're talking about. Customer focus means realizing we're moving to an era we're going to develop, implement an idea, test that idea, get feedback, and evaluate how close we were to building the right thing to begin with. And it places just as much emphasis on that extensibility and capability. Whether we're developing a fully fledged platform in a consulting model or we're a standalone software that's part of the larger ecosystem, we need to broaden our understanding of the impact quality and focus on that first word can have in our organizations as we hit 2020. We've got time for a couple questions, if you guys have any. Right there. Um, I struggle with that. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. Yes. What are their implicit values? Things that they can, that they assume that you know. What are the explicit values? Things that, that they can tell So, um, it's my question. I guess my question uh -huh. is that, that uh, how do you, how do you perceive 
2020. We're talking about the right. Um, what, what, what does that, you know, it, it just, it seems like these words mm -hmm. really are going to not play as much versus Right, right. There's always prioritization. Right. So your question, if I can boil it down, is quality is a difficult word in and by itself. And, and, and you're referencing some of the values we put up there. And in your relation, your, your perspective, there's value. And what are, that, what are those changing and pr even individualistic perspectives that a customer or client or group or aggregate is going to have about what they receive and the associated value or quality that they have on that. That's right. It may not be about honesty. That's right. It may not be about satisfaction. And yet those are the things that I care about that I want to bring right. to a product that needs to be Let me see if I can answer that, because I'm going to try. The values fuel us in the central proposition of why we're doing this in the first place and become a rallying point to our own consistency and emphasis. And it's our belief and at the time, and if we need to iterate on those, we should. If they change and maybe the scrum values stay more consistent, it's possible. I think we could probably with some uh, refinement come up with some values of quality that for us are a rallying point that drive our decisions and actions to deliver the best value and service to our customers that we can. So I think that's the emphasis for that. It's not necessarily what the customers are going to get, but it drives what our clients and customers are going to get from a high perception of quality. And that's the thing. Like I said, quality plus context equals the end result. And so we always have to be contextual about what do we have to adjust? What's that meaning? You know, it's, it's a science. It really is in terms of taking the initial values of what quality emphasis and the applicability to this service product solution that we're providing to reach then the, the desired outcome. And you're right, maybe we need to learn to adjust more rapidly how we can meet that changing customer need, that capability, that extensibility, our, our belief that it's going to stay a static feature and that's going to be in the backlog and we're going to be able to sustain that for the next few months or year is going to diminish. And we need to be more ready to say this is a potential, this is an experience that we want uh, this customer base or group of customers or target audience to have. How do we achieve our belief of what that quality end result in the context of how we're delivering is going to be? It's not an easy question. It's not, it's not a, it's not a, oh, well, here's the answer. It's a lot of matrixed perspectives on that. I think we need to start trying to understand it, though. I think that's the emphasis for this talk is to say, there's that first word, quality. What does it mean? Why are we doing it? Why is it the emphasis of everything else that we're doing in the software profession in, in a software quality perspective? What does it mean to us? What does it mean to our team? What are we rallying around to use it as part of that equation plus context to equal the desired outcome. Because if we don't understand it, it's going to get a lot more variable to the best we can. It's a good, good question. Any more? Thank you. Oh, got, got one from Rex here. This is more of a tactical one, but going back to something you said two slides ago, I think. Okay. Yes. And impact, I think you're talking about, and I took away from that, okay, you're, you're referring in part to cost, but maybe also to other things. So what, what are some of those things that you would you would look at rather I think you I think what I heard you saying was traditionally we look at root cause and ask why did this happen, right? Right. Yes. 
I think it could be a combination of volts. It could be service not available, even though it wasn't maybe reported as such. If you look back and saying, well, even though we didn't get an outcome and people complaining, this underlying service wasn't called on enough to trigger that event and it was down. You know, that kind of a thing. What were risk factors going into that if we click on that? Um, are they using data in a different way? Are they using things not intended? Sure, there's specification and there's what we expected them to do with it. What are they really doing with the data? What are the, da what are, what are the errors really showing? Are they giving us enough information now that we click on it to allow us to determine at a reasonable level what actually happened. It's more than just saying, well, yeah, we have an error log and we're looking at it. Is it doing what we expected? And there's another component of that I was going to emphasize. I think there's ways that we can tag, if you will, from initial, and this goes all the way back to deployment and change management saying, this set of features and this code that was delivered, if we see a trend that this team or this code or uh, this feature area, this customer experience is seeing more errors as a result of us making a change to this. A lot of times there's, we have feature teams that own verticals in terms of functionality or capability or service. And if we can map back to this maps back to that team, or at least to take an initial deep dive look, not just put it in the backlog to say, hey, we're eventually going to get to that, but immediately try and trace it back to, hey, I think you guys own this, or you tell us if if you think we own this, with an, all the integrity you can mus muster. Our initial tagging says that I think this came from something you recently delivered, whether you intend it's an intended bug or not. This is the outcome that the customer experience had. Do you agree or disagree, and what can we do about it? Having that conversation more rapidly is a value add, and I think a quality team or process can put some mechanics around that to uh, let that happen. They don't own the solution, but they definitely can have some insight to probably take the best first stab at saying, let's put this process in place, this mechanism, and iterate on that to try and route a change event and a customer experience where it's an error or unintended consequences back to the teams or the product owners or what combination own that. It's matrix, it's deep, but it's that kind of complexity I think we need to account for coming forward. Oh, oh yeah, and then that's, that's, that, that's that deep dive in terms of capability, you know, how far can we take this? You're absolutely right, but we should have that conversation. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, uh, it's a big elephant, start. Can we take one aspect? Can we take one vertical? Take a bite, see where it takes us because it will me. result in value, I believe. Um, excuse me, just a small announcement. Um, so great turnout. Don't forget to rate the presentation. And um, even after this uh, talk is over, after the Q&A is over, if you have more questions, go grab him. He's not hard to find. He's going to be on, there you go. on the second floor. <laughs> okay. We are out of time, though, in terms of next sessions, right? Way out of time. That's what I thought. All right, come find me. I but that just everything. means you like the Thank movie you for so your much. Time and attention. I appreciate it.